Hello everyone. Uh, so welcome back to the latest lecture session, Introduction to Environmental Studies, right? So in the last uh, couple of uh, sessions, we've been looking at, let's say, what are the major threats that humanity is facing? I guess, uh, you know, what are the adverse effects of uh, various human actions? Certainly the first and foremost adverse effect that we are concerned about and which has a knock-on effect on almost all other adverse effects is global warming. And in that context, I guess, we looked at uh, some other aspects too, as in ozone depletion and what human actions uh, caused ozone depletion and how long it takes, let's say, to, uh, what do we say, uh, tackle, let's say, these issues once they have arisen, right? It's not, uh, I guess, we were trying to see that or say that rather, uh, there is no magic switch that within a year or so you are going to be able to take care of these environmental issues or concerns. We are going to have to live with the adverse effects for generations to come. So prevention is always uh, better here, right? That's the relevant aspect. So in that context, we, I guess we looked at some uh, examples and then we started looking at the contributors to greenhouse gases, right? So let's uh, dive right in. Here we have, uh, what is it now on the y-axis? carbon dioxide equivalents that are uh, given out. So here we have the total and as we can see here the major contributor, let us say, if my may not, I guess I should not say contributor, the major sector that leads to emission of greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide in this context uh, I guess is energy let us say. Well there are different uh, sectors with respect to energy but we will look at them later and I guess uh, a poor second. I guess is agriculture, but typically you know uh, that might uh, come as a surprise to some people, agriculture, why would that be, uh, you know, why would that or how would that release uh, greenhouse gases. So here the issue is that we are not talking about just uh, what do we say typical uh, uh, crops here, we are talking also about animal agriculture if I may say so, where people rear and uh, breed pigs, cows and so on and so forth for human consumption now, right. And also you are going to have to clear the uh, forest let us say, but I think that is covered under different aspect, land use, change and forestry. So again, agriculture is not just uh, what typically comes to your mind, but we are also talking about rearing and breeding animals and so on and so forth. So that is one thing to keep in mind. So poor second, uh, we have agriculture and we have industrial process, we have land use, change and forestry. Well, that is an, uh, what do we say, an important aspect too, right. So let us move on and look at it in greater detail. So now I just uh, removed the total uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we are just looking at uh, the individual sectors contributing to greenhouse gases. So obviously you see that uh, energy, I mean emissions due to or various process related to energy, they are uh, you know uh, the prime what do we say contributors to greenhouse gases. Uh, in the next couple of slides we will see what they are and what and from that particular data you will be able to obviously you know uh, come up with or understand what are some of the steps that you can take to alleviate the situation, right? And here a poor second, I guess. Due to change in regulations, you know, the emissions due to land use change in forestry have been falling, right? Uh, if I can, uh, you know, call this a fallen trend. But again, due to various populist governments all over the world, uh, you know, now again, if I may talk about Brazil, let's say, uh, you know, where we have the Amazonian forests, which are more or less the lungs of the world they are being cut down at a rapid rate, I think 10 football fields per minute, right? I think, uh, not I think, we will look at this later, but if you can uh, take a moment to understand the level of deforestation that is taking place, uh, 10 football fields per minute are being cut down so that, you know, it can be uh, used for other purposes, typically for soybean protection, right? So that, you know, it can, the soy can be fed to what do we say, the pigs or the cows and so on and so forth, let us see. So that is a, a different topic altogether, we will move on to that later. So major aspect is, uh, what is it now, energy or major contributor and then you have, what do we say, waste or wastewater treatment I believe and correct me if I am wrong and industrial process as expected and agriculture I guess, right? So let us move on. So uh, when I remove this particular energy and just look at the other, uh, what do we say, sectors which are major contributors, you see that, you know, there is a trend with respect to decrease in the emissions due to land use change and forestry. But again, as I mentioned recently from what I have seen, I know this is increasing again, the greenhouse gases uh, due to this particular aspect are increasing again, let us see, right? 
and obviously waste, right? That's going to increase. People are going to have to treat the waste. Industrial process, obviously an upward trend as you have more developing countries, that's something to keep in mind. And obviously the same case with agriculture. You know, slow but steady increase, let's see. Again, these are all significant contributors. 4.5 gigatons per annum, I guess. But that's something to keep in mind. So let's uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, here we have greenhouse gases from energy. And more importantly, here we are going to discuss the subsectors. As we have seen earlier, the major contributor of uh, greenhouse gases emissions is due to our, uh, what do we say, uh, emissions during uh, production of or usage of uh, energy in various forms, let's say, right? So here we are going to discuss, let's say, or try to look at what are some of these uh, subsectors. And once you look at the data, you will be able to see, let's say, what you can expect and also maybe uh, try to understand some of the areas where you can innovate or try to regulate and try to cut down on these greenhouse gas emissions, right? So let's look at this. Uh, we, here we have the total, uh, total greenhouse gas emissions from energy and here we have the subsectors as we just discussed about. Can be seen from here, you know, the major emission is due to electricity and heat, let's see, right? So obviously electricity all over the world uh, for heating, Obviously, you have uh, considerable sections of the world, what do we say, that are remarkably cold and you need, uh, what do we say, or the people there need heat, right, and they are heating for their homes. And as you can see, that's one of the major aspects uh, or, you know, major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions from energy, let's say, right. So the need for electricity and the need for, you know, which also includes, I guess, the need for heat. And as you can see, that's certainly rising, right. And next, I guess, we should have transportation. We have transportation. Again, you see from 1990 to 2014, if not almost double, I guess, considerable increase, maybe 175%, if I can say so. And what next do we have? Manufacturing and construction, right? As you can see, this really takes off from around 2000, let's say, right? The greenhouse gas emissions due to manufacturing and construction and other fuel combustion for various purposes and fugitive emissions as in you have escapes, I mean leakings and such uh, during various industrial process and such. So what are the major aspects, uh, I guess, electricity, uh, I mean need for electricity and heat and then transportation and then construction. These are the three major contributors to energy. Uh, what do we say, greenhouse gas emissions due to energy. And as we just discussed earlier, you know, again, obviously energy is by far uh, what do we say, the most, uh, uh, what do we say, contributor uh, for greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere, right, into the atmosphere, pardon me. So if you look at what you can do, I guess you can try to look for uh, better conducting materials, let's say, with respect to heat conductivity so that, uh, and this is something, uh, what do we say, uh, European Union has pushed for, uh, you know, better cladding, I believe, let's say, that's going to keep the house warmer and you don't need as much energy input to keep the houses warmer, so that's something. And obviously, we are going to have a better push for better sources of, uh, what are renewable source of energy for lighting and such, certainly solar power. Again, we'll discuss those aspects later. You can have, what do we say, regulations or innovations that look at minimizing the effects due to transportation and then construction. This might come as a surprise, but we'll look at that. So before we go further, you know, what's the trend? What does it look like? Here we have, let's say again from the Guardian, and I have presented the uh, reference here. As I mentioned, I have come to trust this uh, newspaper pretty well, pretty much. Again, the reason I mentioned was because, you know, they are, uh, you know, not beholden to any particular family or wealthy uh, MNC, right? Uh, they are more or less driven by the funds that are received by you and me. Well, I haven't, uh, what do we say, contributed to them yet. Maybe uh, let me earn some more and I'll start contributing, but I have contributed to the Hindu. The other paper that I said, we will keep referring to, I guess, right? So that's something to keep in mind. We are going to look at these two papers for uh, some information and obviously from some research articles. Again, coming back to what we have, we have here world's energy growth in 2018. So again, uh, world's energy growth, keep that in mind. And obviously, China accounted for more than 30% or I guess a third of the energy growth. And then US, again, a developed country and again, not too far behind India. But again, as you can see, it's uh, less than or slightly less than half of, uh, you know, China's growth, let's see. And then you have other countries out here. 
So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that, you know, uh, even though they are, we are hurtling towards, I guess, a man-made disaster in the form of uh, global warming and its adverse effects on our very uh, sustenance, let's say, right? Uh, we see that the countries are, you know, the world is still uh, on track to break its, uh, what do we say, uh, uh, its own records, let's say, with respect to the need for energy now. And I don't see this uh, being reined in anytime soon. I guess, again, uh, only wake-up call can be uh, disasters. Let's say, for example, after corona, now people realize uh, different aspects, let's say, especially with respect to the need for public health infrastructure, good health in general, and the need to rein in human expansion into, uh, you know, natural biospheres and such, right? But with respect to global warming and such, you know, there is not going to be one knock on the door that, you know, alerts you. You know, we are having these knocks or warnings every day, but people don't listen to them because people have gotten used to it. And the point I believe it's, you know, going to reach is that, you know, some decades down the line, it's going to be too late for people to wake up and, you know, take change or, you know, not take change, pardon me, bring about change, let's say. Anyway, but hopefully uh, that's going to be only the worst case scenario and, you know, you guys and hopefully me too are going to have a better future, but let's keep our fingers crossed there, right? Again, you know, remarkable growth in energy in 2018. And moving on, we looked at, let's say, uh, what do we say, construction or manufacturing as one of the major, what do we say, contributing factors to greenhouse gas emissions, right? So, as you can see here, again from the Guardian, uh, you know, if concrete was a country, it would be the third largest carbon emitter in the world. So, if we look at percentage of carbon emissions, I think this is also from, I think, maybe 2019, if I'm not wrong, I think that's when I got the data or 2018, but to my knowledge, it's from 2019. So, percentage of, of global carbon emissions, let's say in 2019, 30% is from China, US around 15, and then concrete, I guess, you know, worldwide usage of concrete in construction, you know, it released uh, greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide rather, uh, you know, in excess of India, let's say, in, in excess of what India contributed to uh, the world's emissions, let's say, right? So, that's something to keep in mind. For example, I guess what I'm trying to say is even though we think of construction as a benign task, you know, the materials and what we try to do with them, they contribute heavily to greenhouse gas emissions. So, they, people are trying to, you know, make some emissions, uh, not emissions, pardon me, uh, make some innovation here or bring forth some innovation, pardon me, and try to minimize this particular aspect too. But again, you know, some of our daily activities which we seem, uh, you know, think ben uh, to be benign, lead to remarkable usage of uh, or release of, pardon me, greenhouse gases. One thing is internet usage, but uh, we'll look at that later, I guess. Or rather here, we have it here, right? Uh, you know, what do we have here? We have China, US, India, Russia, and far out UK here. And obviously concrete, the third largest, let's say. And then shipping, well, that's uh, surprising, but compared to road, transportation via road, it's better. And then you have internet and aviation. Right. The key aspect is that, you know, internet usage, I guess, again, uh, you know, either with respect to the maintenance of the servers or with respect to cooling, let's say, and I guess you can look at the details, you know, is a remarkable computer, uh, contributor to greenhouse gas emissions or carbon dioxide emissions and thus is growing remarkably fast. So, uh, the next time you think about uh, Googling something, I guess, you know, this is something to keep in mind, right, internet. And aviation, we'll look at uh, considerable data, in, not considerable, some data in this regard. So, uh, again, I think it's better where we look at the data, but one thing to keep in mind is you have these globe trotters, let's say footballers, fashion designers, and so on and so forth, you know, but, you know, we have a price to pay for that, right? As you can see, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions due to aviation is remarkably high, higher than the whole uh, GHG emissions due to UK, I guess, right? So, that's something to keep in mind when you are thinking about lifestyle changes, I guess, right? So, let's move on. I just want to look at uh, China and India. We are going to look at, uh, you know, growth story of China and India, again, with respect to, I guess, GDP and purchasing power, let's say, and then the environmental costs and talk about quality of life. I guess that's what, or that's where we are all, uh, you know, that's what we want, right? As in, when I have a new class, I typically ask them, let's say, a new set of students, what do they want in life, right? But as I mentioned, I believe I discussed earlier, 
most people are not sure where exactly they want to be well that's to be expected but most people want uh, certainly good food uh, a good spouse a good house and i guess uh, the other luxuries that are materialistic being the from the materialistic society that we have turned out to be you know uh, material wealth let's see right certainly you are going to have to have food health and water so that's something we are going to look at right so here we have on the uh, y axis uh, what do we say gdp right in uh, trillion us dollars and on the x axis we have obviously the year and we see i guess i mean 1947 i guess that's when we were, we gained independence and keep in mind that uh, you know democracy uh, authoritarian states different uh, modes of development different levels of freedom with respect to uh, speech right right and that's i guess something not to be discounted uh, one aspect uh, that the reason that i brought that up is one uh, people typically look at only the material wealth while uh, not taking into account what do we say human freedom well i think that's it's difficult to uh, put a price on that anyway let me not digress so we see that from 1990 right i think due to the policies of mr jiang zemin when they opened up the economy let's say you know china uh, you know you uh, what can i say witnessed exponential growth again 1990 we faced the financial crisis mr uh, narsimha rao too opened up the economy but we have different restrictions being in a democratic country and then you know we too have been witnessing development but not to the extent of china let's say right so you know looks like you know people chinese people are remarkably well off compared to indians at least when we look at or consider 1990p to be the benchmark uh, so if i look at per capita as an in income per capita or per person you know here we have i guess uh, china at around 9 or 10000 let's say and india about 2000 dollars per uh, year let's say right so again keep in mind in both countries you have uh, what do we say considerable what do we say uh, how can i put it now you have a considerable fraction of the people who are remarkably rich not considerable a small fraction of the people who are remarkably rich and obviously a large fraction of the people who are uh, relatively poor but still averages do give us an idea about where the chinese are and where the indians are with respect to material wealth let's say, right but if you look at purchasing power parity which gives you an idea about you know uh, what they can purchase actually with that money that they are making we see we are relatively better off but again china is still what is it now more than two times better or the chinese are two more than two times better off uh, compared to us let's see right so typically quite a few people want to emigrate and this is the reason why if i bring us into the picture you know and we compare the data with respect to china and india with respect to gdp per person or per capita and with respect to purchasing power parity we see that uh, the people in the united states are remarkably well off again uh, even there there are considerable issues as in 1% of the population of the us controlling i think 50% or 60% of uh, what do we see the wealth so that's certainly an issue so you have 99% just controlling or contributing to 40% wealth if i may say so and thus there are great inequalities there but again let me not go into th those aspects but as you see why uh you know uh, you know you uh, given a chance quite a few people uh, you know chasing material wealth and quality of life they try to emigrate and the reason is i guess this uh, it's economics now you can uh, make more money and then thus better quality of life too typically so that's something to keep in mind let me come back to this later and so we have the growth stories here right we have exponential growth here and as you will see here when we look at the greenhouse gas emissions let's say and carbon dioxide equivalents what do we see here chinese really took off from 2000 and it mirrors their economic growth too and same case with india i guess from 1990 a gentle but steady growth i guess right so what do we see here obviously as both the economies are uh, what do we say becoming more industrialized earlier they were uh, agriculture based economies now they are becoming more industrialized and again typically you are not going to have access to remarkably clean fuels Uh, or let's say cleaner uh, what do we say techniques or industrial process let's say right obviously why is that because you know it takes time to learn and other than that they are typically what do we say costlier typically again but once the supply chain has been worked out let's say and there is widespread usage the cost does come down but again that takes time let's say right and obviously when we are 
talk, talking about sustenance itself, you know, we don't really care about these aspects, but these aspects do bite us in the back remarkably, se remarkably severely later on. So what do we see here? Chain is, let's say, greenhouse gas emissions remarkably high in 2014, US typically more or less stagnant since 1990, right? And here we are out here, India, I guess, but again, as you see, we are on a steady uh, path climbing up, let's say, right? So, you know, looks like the Chinese are to blame, uh, like uh, for everything, but that's obviously not the case, different stories out here, right? Growth stories, pardon me. If I look at, let's say, carbon dioxide emission per capita or per person now, that gives you a truer picture of, you know, the contribution of, uh, what do we say, different countries or the people, let's say, uh, towards the greenhouse gases. So now you see that China is somewhere out here, India obviously more or less than half, but you see a person living in the US, let's say, he leads to, what do we say, almost, let's say, if I compare this to India, let's say this three, three, eight, six times more, I guess, right? Six times more greenhouse gas emissions. So even though US as a country is right now emitting lesser than what China is, but if you look at uh, per capita or per person emissions, you see that, you know, the emissions from the U.S. I mean, a person in the, living in the U.S. is remarkably higher. So, I guess here we have the carbon footprint now. Again, this is with respect to uh, living styles. Could it, it could be due to uh, different industrial process, right? And it could be due to uh, uh, lifestyles, let's say, right? The type of food they consume and so on and so forth. So, that's a different aspect here. So, but uh, we'll come back to this. As in Typically, we are now going to ask who is going to, you know, take care of this world now, right? Uh, India and China, they want to grow, they want to make their uh, citizens uh, relatively wealthy or if not at least, uh, you know, will certainly not let them suffer every day from very poor wages, right? And they want to give them access to good food and uh, good health and so on and so forth. So, the economy is certainly going to become industrialized, more emissions. Uh, but now the uh, world is already at a tipping point. So, who is going to pay now? Well, that's the crux of the issue now, right? So, again, as I mentioned now, the key aspect is that, you know, China is increasing, right? I mean, China's energy requirement, let's say, or growth is increasing. And you see that US, though, it has been developed, it still accounts for a lot. That's something to keep in mind. And obviously, uh, India too, and I guess we are going to uh, catch up. So that's something to keep in mind. Even though the developing countries are now, uh, what do we say, uh, the growth rate with respect to the energy consumption, let's say, uh, is high, with respect to US, which is a developed country, you know, its growth rate is considerable too. That's something to keep in mind. So what are some of the issues? Obviously, you know, we are talking about pollution now, right? Uh, one major aspect is pollution. Here we are not talking about carbon dioxide itself uh, due to, I guess, transportation, road dust, industrial process, uh, what do we say, uh, releasing gases and so on and so forth. So here, what do we have here? Uh, we have again a guardian source and what is this about? Ambient air quality or air quality, let's say. And here we are talking about PM 2.5, particulate matter of size less than 2.5 micrometers or microns. That's something to keep in mind. We'll look at this in detail later, but if you have an overview, you know, you see that the hot spots are obviously, you know, with respect to or in India and the eastern coast of China and some of the developing countries out here, let's see, right? And this is certainly going to get worse. And now, obviously, you know, PM 2.5 or particulate matter 2.5, once we inhale, it even enters the bloodstream you know, through our uh, lungs, let's say, because it's so small, I think I have a graphic out here, we'll come back to that. But as you can see, due to, I guess, the technologies that are being used out there, typically the developed countries, they are relatively better off, right? You have European UN, Union, you have the US, you have Canada, and so on and so forth. And obviously, the least developed countries where, you know, though the pollution is less, the quality of life might be relatively, uh, what do we say, poorer, let's say, right? Again, South Africa, and so on and so forth. But again, we are concerned with India, and I guess we are somewhere out here, Rurki, right? As you can see, or I guess Rurki should be much more up here. We are bang in the middle of remarkably polluted areas now, right? And if you have, or if you remember the first time you stepped in Rurki, typically the air quality here is much better, as it will be remarkably evident to those people who travel from Delhi to Rurki, let's say. You know, in Delhi, it's remarkably 
hellish if I may say so, especially you are coming, if you are coming to Roorkee in uh, December, you can feel that, you know, it's uh, acidified, remarkably polluted air out there. Again, let me not go into uh, detail there. So let's look at this. Nine of the world's 10 most polluted cities are in India, including Kanpur and Delhi. This is the average again, keep that in mind. 10 of the world's most polluted are in India. So that's something to, uh, what do we say, certainly worry about. So as I mentioned, I, we were talking about particulate matter, right? We are talking about uh, emissions and we are talking about, let's say, the size, let's say. You know, different, you know, our breathing system, let's say our respiratory system, pardon me, acts as a filter. You know, we have the uh, follicles or the hair in the nose. They filter out some, uh, what do we say, dust, right? And I guess dust also can be accumulating in our respiratory tract. But this PM 2.5, so to get an idea about how small PM 2.5 is, this is a hair follicle, right, human hair, 50 to 70 micrometers. This is beach sand, right? And here we talk about PM10. PM10 too will lead to adverse effect, but typically it does not enter the bloodstream, right? right? And on this you have the PM2.5. And what are we talking about? Combustion particles, organic compounds, metals, and so on and so forth, let's see. So PM10 and more importantly PM2.5 is what we are concerned with. And this can lead to remarkable effects, you know, typically I guess the mechanism is not clearly understood, but there is clear evidence, let's say, or epidemiological studies have been done where, let's say, you link air, you can link air pollution and especially PM 2.5 pollution to, what do we say, increased levels of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, you know, cysts in the brain and so on and so forth, let's see. So there is remarkable evidence and again, as I mentioned, what, what's our situation here? Well, as you can see, it's remarkably poor now, right? So that's something to keep in mind when we are talking about growth, you obviously don't want to, and I guess, uh, live, uh, what do we say, a very, or have a very poor quality of life while accumulating wealth in the bank, let's say, right? And at the end of the day, you know, you're not going to take that money out with you wherever we end up with, right? After death, right? But, uh, you know, you need to have a good quality of life and that's something, I guess, that's being affected right now. So let's move on. And as we just mentioned earlier, we saw that Delhi has the, or you know, uh, what is it now? Eight out of 10 of the world's most polluted cities were in India. That's something, uh, that tells you something remarkably, I guess, right? So PM10 levels, particulate matter of size 10 micrometers or less, right? When we say PM2.5, it's a particulate matter that will go through the, or you know, lesser than that particular size of 2.5 microns. And when we talk about PM10, uh, we are talking about those particles that are lesser than 10 micrometers in size. So available for the year or for the period 2010 to 2016, right? And what do we, microgram per meter cube, I guess, right? And what do we see? Delhi, remarkably polluted, again, Bombay and so on and so forth. But Delhi, I guess, tops the list for this uh, period of six years. And again, I do not have health data in India. Again, poorly maintained records, or at least I could not access them easily. So I did not present that here, let's say. But again, we will look at the overall data with respect to India, and you will see that these malignant tumors and such, the uh, rate of growth of deaths due to malignant tumors and some of these unexplained reasons, uh, and also some card due to cardiovascular disease is remarkably high. And what's typically the reason? You know, it's due to air pollution and I guess obviously due to water pollution now, right? So that's something to keep in mind. And uh, before I move on, I guess looks like uh, I'm done with respect to uh, time here and uh, we will end this session for now. But I forget that I wanted to talk about a particular book to keep the, to keep you motivated or, you know, to uh, share some uh, worthwhile uh, knowledge with you. I guess the book I'm going to talk about is The Anarchy. Right, it's written by uh, William Dalrymple. Right, it talks about how are these upheavals in society and what led to such upheavals during the fall of the Mughal Empire and when I guess the British were gaining a foothold in India, how they were able to gain a foothold. As in, typically, we read about wars, just people coming in, East India Company and French India Company, and so on and so forth. But I guess it's remarkably more complex, it's human greed, certainly. And, you know, infighting certainly, 
and there are different aspects and it's a very remarkably well researched book it's not a novel it's a well researched book and well referenced book so that i would uh, encourage you to not encourage you if you are looking for uh, books to read this is something that you can look at and i guess we'll just look at that from time to time over the duration of the class i guess to uh, you know just to keep the class interesting i guess right okay i guess with that i'll end today's session and thank you